In this video, we're going to talk about metabolism. Specifically, we'll talk about aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Now, in the textbooks, what you typically see is that uh, an easy definition is that anaerobic metabolism involves short duration, high intensity activity. And during that type of metabolism, you'd be using your ATP stores and phosphocreatine stores. As the activity is prolonged in duration, the intensity goes down and you revert more to aerobic metabolism. So typically, the first 10 to 15 seconds, alactic anaerobic. 15 seconds to 2 minutes would be lactic anaerobic, where we're working uh, using uh, glycogen and glucose as our major stores. Moderately high, in, or fairly high intensity, um, but as I mentioned, 15 to 2 minutes. And then as we continue on, we go to aerobic metabolism, where again, we're using carbohydrates. And in longer metabolism, we longer durations, we're using fat. And Basically, that's the story that you hear. One aspect that typically isn't covered to a great extent is recovery intervals. Now, the recovery intervals can make a big difference. Take, for example, the game of squash. When we think of squash, most people think it's a very anaerobic game because if you don't play a lot of squash, you play your game, what happens the next day? You get what's called squash bum. You get this squash bum because you do a lot of lunging around that court. And with these eccentric contractions, you tend to get delayed onset muscle soreness. So you're thinking, well, this is a really high-intensity high intensity game. It must be very anaerobic. And of course, there are a lot of anaerobic aspects to squash. But you have to think about the actual duration of the activity. The average rally in squash is about 10 to 15 seconds. Typically, you don't find, unless you're a very good player, anybody going beyond 20 seconds for a rally. How long are you allowed to rest between picking up the ball or the end of the rally and picking up the ball to start the um, service again? Well, according to the rules, squash is supposed to be continuous activity. So you're supposed to pick up that ball, go back, serve right away. The statistics show that on average, the rest period between points is about seven to eight seconds. So if you have a rally that's 10 to 15 seconds, and you only have less than 10 seconds of rest, then you've got a work to rest ratio of about one to one. 10 seconds work, 10 seconds rest. Now what you'll find is that any activity that has a work to rest ratio of two to one, or one to one or less, is typically more aerobic in nature. Right. So again in squash, 10 seconds activity, 10 seconds rest. You don't have much time to rest or recover from that previous 10 second bout before you start your activity again. So you need a very high aerobic base in order to play squash well. In fact, there have been some squash champions that have gone from squash and ran marathons and almost won them. A Canadian champion in the 1980s once led a marathon for the first 21 miles before he got beat by a, a um, a regular marathon runner because squash is such an aerobic sport but as we mentioned before it has very strong anaerobic components because you have to sprint at times to get to the ball but you still need to have a high aerobic component typically your your heart rates are around 80 to 85 percent of maximum so for a highly trained individual they can go for a long period of time aerobically at that at that level now let's think about tennis what do you think tennis is well you watch Wimbledon, you watch the French Open, they play five sets of tennis, you think, geez, they're playing for three or four hours. It's got to be an aerobic game. Well, yes, of course it's an aerobic game. But tennis, depending on the type of surface you play on, can be very, very different. So consider Wimbledon. Wimbledon, you're playing on grass. Now, especially in the 1990s and earlier, the surface was different than they have today. The grass surface, when the ball hits, the ball slid and then didn't bounce very high. And there wasn't much friction, so the ball didn't lose much velocity. So what you'd find is that people who had a very good serve and volley game would win quite often. So again, Pete Sampras in those days won a lot of Wimbledons until Roger Federer came along and, and beat his record. But what would he do? He would serve the ball, he had a great serve, and he'd come in and volley. So either he would serve and ace the individual, so that means they, they didn't even touch the ball, you'd have an activity period of less than one second. 
or he'd serve and he'd come in and try and volley the ball. And now you'd have an activity level of maybe two, no more than three seconds. So he had three seconds of very intense activity. Next question is, how much rest did he get? Well, according to the laws of tennis, you have 25 seconds between points. So if you only have three seconds of activity and you get 25 seconds of rest, you've got a one to eight work to rest ratio. Now, according to the physiology, typically, if you have an activity that has a one to five work to rest ratio or higher, then you've got enough time to work anaerobically. And so somebody like Pete Sampras was very good at working a lactic anaerobic. Pete Sampras never won the French Open. Why is that? Well, you could argue, of course, his game wasn't suited for it. He didn't play the baseline well. But you could also argue that his metabolism wasn't suited for it. Because at the French Open, you play on clay. The ball hits the clay, digs into the soft clay, which slows it down, and then causes it to bounce up higher. So Pete Sampras's big serve at that time wasn't as big a weapon at the French Open because it's, his serve had to slow down. So what you see are people like Rafael Nadal um, and others, uh, smaller players, uh, Bjorn Borg, who won a lot of French Opens. People who would stay on the baseline for a long period of time and have long rallies and retrieve the balls. So how long would they normally hit? Well, if Rafael Nadal or Bjorn Borg back in the 70s are playing, their rallies would typically be 20 seconds, 25 seconds, 30 seconds long. So again, think about the work to rest ratio. 25 seconds of work, 25 seconds of rest. One to one work to rest ratio. What kind of activity is that? That's an aerobic game. So if Pete Sampras is an alactic anaerobic athlete, he's not gonna do well at the French Open unless he trains more aerobically and vice versa. So even within the game of tennis, you can have different types of metabolism. And so that is the, the big challenge why very few people have ever won Wimbledon and the French Open beside each other. Um, Roger Federer has done it, and um, Rafael Nadal has done it, among a few others, but not many others. Because again, you've got different styles, and then you have to have those different metabolisms. You can use these kind of facts to your advantage. So for example, what if you're a coach of a basketball team. And your basketball team, unfortunately, your high school basketball team has a bunch of very short players. And you're playing against a big team from a big city. And they've got a front row of forwards who are all six foot five. You think you don't have a chance. What can you do? Give up or change metabolism? Now, in basketball, you bring the ball up, set up your offense, and if you've got a big center or a big forward, get them established under the post, pass it to them, boom, they dunk it, and then you jog back. So you've got high intensity activity for a short period of time, then you've got this somewhat prolonged recovery period of just jogging back to play some defense. These guys are more anaerobic in nature, the big guys. So as a coach of a small team, what would you do? You would have a fast break offense. And so as soon as you got the ball, you would toss it down the, the court and have them sprint down to the other end and throw the ball up. Then when they're tr the opposition is trying to get the ball back, you would put a full court press on them. So there's no time to rest. So now it's continuous activity all the time. Those big guys are probably going to, to kick your butt in the first part of the game because all your guys are five foot eight and they're six foot five. But by the second half of the game, those big guys can't run up and down the court anymore because you've forced them to go from an anaerobic game to an aerobic game, and they may not have that metabolism. You can do the same thing in football. What if your high school football team is a bunch of small guys? And now again, you're playing a big high school that has a bunch of 300-pound linemen. How would you ever beat such huge football players? Same thing. Change metabolism. Go from your traditional huddle-based offense where you get 20 seconds for your huddle, you come out and you snap the ball, run the play, then everybody stands around, the referee picks up the ball, puts it down, blows the whistle, you get another 20 seconds. So in reality, you've probably got 30, 35 seconds or more of rest between plays. How long does a football play last? The average football play lasts less than seven seconds. So if you have seven seconds 
of, of, uh, of play, and you've got 35 seconds of rest, you've got a 1 to 5 work to rest ratio. Therefore, 1 to 5 is an anaerobic game. So what do you want to do? You want those big linemen to become aerobic. Have a no huddle offense. So now the quarterback comes out. Rather than calling the play in the huddle, he goes to the, to the line and he calls out the play with his, his audibles. Blue 26, blue 26, set, hut, hut. Hands the ball off to the halfback. He goes in off tackle. Boom, he gets up. Run back to the line of scrimmage. Red, 38, red, 38. Toss the ball out to the fullback. He runs around. Boom, he gets tackled. You stand back up again, get back on the line, call the play again. Green 74, green 74, throw a pass to the wide receiver. Never stop. Those 300-pound linemen can't keep going like that. So again, they'll probably be beating you in the first quarter, maybe in the first half, but if you can change the metabolism, you'd have an advantage in the second half because they can't move anymore. So when we're thinking about aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, don't just think about 10 seconds equals alactic, 5 minutes equals aerobic. You've got to think of the recovery. And you can use those recovery periods to try and change metabolism to your advantage.